We're here today with Professor Mac Margaret Macmillan from St. Anthony's College, Oxford, to discuss the relationship between history and policy making. What's the use of history for today's decision makers? Professor Macmillan, welcome to the Graduate Institute. You've um, written a great deal uh, about a number of 20th century turning points, specifically about the origins and legacies of World War I but also about the United States' decision in the 1970s to open a relationship with the People's Republic of China. But today I'd like to focus on another aspect uh, of your work, and that's really the relationship between the, his the past, history, and the present, between the historian and the policymakers, and particularly on the question of what ways, in which ways, can history be useful for today's policymakers. But let me first ask you a, a general question about, um, about the relationship between the historian and the object of his study, that is, between the historian and the past. We all have our baggage. We all come from somewhere. We have our personal histories, our national histories. You're Canadian. I'm a Finnish. I'm a Finn. Uh, and these personal histories are bound to one way or another affect our judgment, affect our interests, affect our objectivity. And yet the professional historian, the good historian, is supposed to be objective. He's not supposed to, he or she is not supposed to have any or let prejudices, personal feelings affect his or her judgment about the past. So given this seeming contradiction, is it really possible for a historian um, to write objective history that can be at the same time useful uh, for today's policymakers? Is this truly possible? I, well, I do believe very strongly that there are standards in the historical profession and that whatever our own particular backgrounds and biases are, that they, there are clear ways of looking at evidence of examining evidence, of analyzing evidence, which I think across the historical profession we agree on. And the idea that you should distort evidence, ignore pieces of evidence that don't fit into your thesis, these, these are just seen as things that don't, shouldn't happen in the historical profession. So I think they're sort of understandings about how historians should behave when they're looking at the past and how they should analyze the past and how they should keep an open mind about evidence and, and continue to look for new sources of evidence and ask new questions. All of these, I think, go into making up what we call the sort of professional historian approach. That could be someone in a university or outside a university, but someone who treats history as something with respect and treats it seriously. That doesn't mean it will, that will compensate for all our biases, but I think it will help. Mm -hmm. And so you get, I think, examples of historians who have written very critical histories of their own countries because I think they've been true to themselves. And a lot of the really interesting work on German history, for example, I'm sometimes quite contentious linking um, the pre-1914 Germany with, with Hitler's Germany, but uh, helping to open out new ways of looking at German history has been done by German historians. And I think more credit to them that, you know, I think historians have to be able to look at their own histories with a great deal of skepticism and, if necessary, deal with the uncomfortable things. I think it sometimes helps to come from a small country, um, you're Finnish, I'm Canadian, um, both small in terms of, of population and, and influence Not in the size. world. Not in size, we're, we're, we're a bit bigger, I must admit. But I think it gives us a sort of detachment when we look at international relations. I mean, I think if you're an American historian, you have to sort out being an American. Whether you're critical of the United States or whether you are not critical of the United States, in a sense, you're taking a position. And I think coming from outside the great power structure, in fact, gives us a sort of advantage. I like to think as a Canadian, I'm relatively detached. From the, from, the, from the issues and from the powers. If I were writing Canadian history, I might be different. To follow up on what you just said, um, in recent years, uh, the so-called transnational history has become increasingly popular as, uh, if not a method, then as a way of viewing the past. And it's even been suggested that transnational history will transplant, will replace uh, national histories. Is there some kind of unredeemable tension here between national history on the one hand and other types of particularly transnational histories 
on the other hand. Do you think, in other words, is there, in your view, uh, a right kind of history, uh, a superior kind of history that we should, as professional historians, be focusing upon? I don't think there is one right kind of history. I think there are many ways of approaching history. And I think what makes history so interesting is we're constantly re ordering it, um, reordering what we mean by history, rethinking what we mean by history and asking different questions. Um, you know, we ask questions often that reflect changes in our own societies. I mean, when I was an undergraduate in the 1960s, there was virtually no women's history because people just weren't interested in it. Um, once you got a women's movement and people realized that women had a place to play in society which they hadn't really fully been allowed to play, then I think you got a lot of interest in women's history. And the same thing I think is true of gay history. For example, history of, of minorities in, in different countries. And so I think we keep on reformulating history. And I would hate to see any one kind of history being held up as the model of, of good history. Now, transnational history, I think, is very fruitful and very interesting and reminds us of the linkages across borders. But I don't think we can dispense with national history completely, partly because the nation state has been very powerful at certain times in the past. And so to fail to take that into account and to fail to look at the fact that people did define themselves often in terms of their, the nation state to which they belonged. I think if we don't look at national histories, we'd be missing something out. But I'd like to think we now look at them in a different way. Well, let's try to think about a uh, practical example. Uh, what comes to mind now, we're in May of 2015, is, for example, the ongoing crisis in, in Syria and Iraq. The rise of, uh, rise of ISIS as a major threat to regional security. If you were a historian that was called upon to advise policymakers on these issues, uh, what would you recommend would be the useful kind of history, the usable history, the usable past or histories that would help policymakers help us better understand um, this transnational movement uh, called ISIS that say, came seemingly from nowhere uh, but has come to dominate large tracts of territory in the Middle East? I mean, I think perhaps two sets of history, well, three maybe. I mean, I think you need to look at the history of the region itself mm -hmm. and understand that history and understand the different forces at play there because otherwise you, 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 know, you won't be able to really properly understand what's happening today. But I think also histories where very strong ideological movements have swept uh, across borders and, and had a huge impact. I mean, the history of Bolshevism, for example, in the early 20th century, um, religious movements uh, in earlier periods, um, the, French move, the, the ideas sparked by the French Revolution. I mean, this may give us some understanding of why there is this transnational appeal um, of, of, of ISIS or, or Daesh, if you want to call it that. So I think that would help. And I think also possibly we might at least be helped in thinking about what's going on in Syria by looking at other examples of long-running struggles where you had mul a multiplicity of parties which kept shifting sides. Mm -hmm. And the awful analogy which I think keeps coming up is the Thirty Years' War in Europe, mm -hmm. where there was a strong mixture of ideology, different religious views, but also ambitions, minorities, um, peoples trying to, to carve out states for themselves, and simple thugs who saw an opportunity to gain loot and put, throw the weight around and do all the sorts of things which you're not allowed to do in a more orderly society. So I think, you know, I, I think to think about Syria, and, and we're looking at a state which isn't yet failed, but where the uh, capacity of the state to actually impose order is, is so severely limited that I don't see any hope of the conflict any, ending anytime soon. So I think we may need to conceive of the conflict in Syria as something different than you know, one side against another side. It, it's very different from that. You mentioned the, the Thirty Years' War. Um, so we're looking at 17th century Europe and we're comparing this with 21st century Middle East. These sorts of comparisons, um, you know, looking for useful analogies from the past, may in principle be appealing for policymakers who want to find straightforward answers. Um, but isn't looking at a series of events four centuries in the past in one region, comparing it with another series of events taking place today four centuries later in a different region, a little bit dangerous, perhaps misleading? Um, now, if I'm a policymaker, I might even be tempted to say, no, 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 I'm not going to go there to look for any kind of advice. Yeah, I can see why a policymaker would say that. And I wouldn't say that looking at the Thirty Years' War 
would give you any very clear uh, guidance on what to do about Syria. But what it might do is instill what is perhaps a sense of realism and even humility that it may be that no one can solve this. You know, that there may be no solution and that it may be on the power of any one person or any one uh, nation to solve it. And that may, um, it's not very consoling, but it may at least help us to look at the Syrian conflict in a realistic way. I mean, there have been so many announced breakthroughs and it's all going to be okay now, we're going to get the sides to sit down, and it hasn't happened. And maybe we should be reminded that you do get conflicts um, which do drag on and are very, very difficult to solve. It doesn't help us to solve it, but maybe makes us a bit more realistic. Allow me to, to push you a little bit more on, on, a, on another related matter. Um, today we live in this rapidly transforming, increasingly integrating, globalized world. We have particularly uh, been inundated with rapid new communications, um, contrasted, say, to the era of the 17th century and 30 years war. We have our Twitters, our Facebooks and other forms of social media that clearly have an impact on how we perceive the modern world, how rapidly we communicate or miscommunicate within and across uh, borders. Do these developments, um, globalization, so-called globalization in general, change the significance of history and how it can indeed be used or abused by policymakers today? Well, you know, the trouble is when you're living through something, it's very difficult to really get a handle on what, what's actually important and what isn't. Um, you know, history is full of examples of people who missed the single most important you know, innovation in their own times. Um, it took 50, sometimes 100 years for it to be, appear as important as it was. I mean, I think we may be in danger of overestimating the power of the social media. Um, they're very noisy. You get waves of people tweeting about something they don't like. Um, but how much is it actually changing? You know, there was a lot of talk in, in the Arab Spring when it started in Egypt about how the social media really made all this possible. And then when people look closer, they say, well, actually, no. There's a lot of, there's a lot of meetings going on beforehand, a lot of groups forming. You know, this was not something that just blew up. And you can't put it all down to the social media. So I think it's very difficult myself to gauge just how important this is. For the future historian, at the advent of social media and other rapid communication methods, email and so forth, uh, will make life kind of difficult, it seems. What I mean is but if you think in a sort of traditional sense of researching and writing history, uh, take 17th century Europe, the Thirty Years' War. Uh, it's fairly straightforward to narrow down a set of sources, archives and so on, a set of data um, to be used, to be researched in order to write this narrative. There's a limited number of sources one can ultimately find. But if you begin to think about how we're going to write early 21st century history in the future, uh, with all these electronic communications, including social media, the challenges, it seems to me, for the future historian, I feel flipped sorry for them, uh, writing about our present, the early 21st century, is going to be very, very different than if you're writing about the 17th century or about ancient history. Do you have any thoughts about for future historians, any advice on how to deal with these kinds of dilemmas? Uh, of research. I might be tempted to become a political scientist, I think. Um, no, I don't know what's going to happen, and it's something I think that a lot of us are, are sort of wondering about. Um, you know, a lot of this stuff is evanescent. It disappears. You know, we tend to think that everything, you know, once, it's, once an electronic thing is made, it continues to exist. It doesn't. Websites disappear, tweets disappear, emails disappear. And what's also happening, I think, is that people are getting an awful lot more cautious in what they'll put in electronic communications. And maybe not tweeting, because tweets are short. Sure. And so you can still make, you know, put your foot in it, but you can't do it as badly in, in, as in a longer thing. But you know, most governments I know, and most people I know, don't put much in emails. Mm -hmm. Or they put, let's talk about that issue one day that we were talking about the other day. You know, yeah. Because of freedom of information, because it's easy to find this stuff, it's easy to leak this stuff. Um, what I think is going to be really difficult for future historians is what is the record going to be? You know, there's going to be too much that's insubstantial, a um, lot of it, and not enough that is really substantial. So what were people really thinking? Unless they put it down in a long email, which they're less likely to do these days, or they put it on paper, which they, some of them might still do, or they write their diaries or record something, 
I don't know what the record's going to be. Let me move on to some uh, local issues. Uh, we are in Geneva, um, so I really have to ask you something that relates to Geneva and Geneva International in, uh, in particular. This is the city of peace. This is uh, the house of peace, Maison de la Paix, uh, where we are right now. And Geneva is generally known around the world, if it is known, uh, for the international organizations that are based here. Mostly these are humanitarian organizations that were created to address um, a whole host of difficult issues like refugees um, or to work out perhaps solutions to ongoing conflicts. However, international organizations do not have a very good reputation for being effective. Uh, they're often seen as putting some band-aids on big problems they will find impossible to solve. Uh, but in terms of the history of international organizations over the past century or so, I wonder if you could comment on if there's something and if something then what, that these international organizations or perhaps a future Secretary General of the United Nations could learn from the experiences of the past century of international organizations. Well, you know, I think we attack international organizations like the UN in an unrealistic way. We expect them to do what they can't do. I mean, they're as good as their members, and if the great powers won't cooperate, then they're not going to work, um, or not going to work terribly well. And, you know, yes, sometimes what we do is put a Band-Aid on things, but if I were a refugee, I'd rather have the Band-Aid in the form of humanitarian assistance and, and, a, and a camp in which to live and education for my children than, than nothing. And I think what they also do is help to build the sense of an international community. Um, I do like to think that we are capable of thinking of ourselves as inhabiting the same planet and, and sharing the same humanity and having some sort of responsibility towards helping each other. And it seems to me that is something that has developed. Um, you know, it's easy to point to the things that aren't working, but it seems to me that we have now got, of course, this is not just the UN. We've now got a multiplicity of international organizations, which didn't exist before 1914. We have strong regional organizations, um, in some cases, um, NAFTA, for example, um, ASEAN, um, we, we, I think, um, are building more regional organizations. We've also got strong international organizations dealing with specific activities from international aviation to the World Health Organization. So, you know, I, I think if we think in terms of a web of international organizations, it may look a bit more promising than if we just focus on, say, the UN or the WHO or the World Bank or the IMF. Thank you. Um Sure, many in and around Geneva will, will certainly appreciate your, um, your positive spin uh, on, the, on the significance of international and humanitarian organizations. But let me now go back to the uses of history uh, in, in some more specific way. <clears throat> it seems to me that it's ultimately it's relatively easy to pick examples about the ab abuse, the misuse of history the ways in which history has, for example, been used as a tool of propaganda to justify aggression, to drum up nationalist sentiment. Um, your recent book on the outbreak of World War I, for example, certainly provides numerous cases um, in which this was the case in early 20th century Europe. Um, but I wonder if you could give us some examples about the opposite, about the good use of history, so, so to speak. Uh, perhaps in the last 25 years or so, since the end of the Cold War in the early 1990s. Well, I think domestically, we've had a number of countries that have examined their past and where their record hasn't been good. For example, in Australia, there was a real public discussion about the treatment of the Aboriginals, which did lead to an apology being made by the Australian government, has perhaps been important in raising the awareness of the Australian public you know, that something needs to be done. I think something similar has happened in Canada. It may not produce results right away, but I think examining the, the dark sides of your history can help to um, bring the problems of that particular community to the fore and, and give you some sense that you ought to do something. And I think history has been used for reconciliation. I mean, the, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in South Africa, I think, was effective. Um, they chose to deal with it in that way. Um, I think in Rwanda there has been an attempt to look at the past. Um, in other countries there hasn't been, and I tend to think countries that don't examine their past in the end are going to have trouble with them. 
Um, you know, you can understand when it's very raw, as it was in Yugoslavia, you don't want to start looking at um, all the different problems. But if you leave it, sooner or later it's going to come back, I think, and, and you're going to have to deal with it. Tomorrow you're going to discuss World War One in a public lecture here at the Maison de la Paix. Um, we've discussed a little bit uh, or now earlier the analogies one can perhaps draw, the lessons one can draw from various historical events such as the Thirty Years' War uh, in the 17th century. And one can, I guess, make the case, uh, as you have, that the Thirty Years' War carries some relevance uh, with regard to the events taking place in Syria and Iraq um, at the present. Um, but perhaps we could move on to World War One, which of course is much closer to our present. Um, what would you identify a hundred years later, a hundred years after the events, as the main legacies of either the origins or the legacies or the ending of the so-called Great War? I, well, there's so many legacies, I think, and so hard to identify a main one. I think, I think you know, if I had to sort of sum it all up, it's the sense that something changed forever with that war um, and that it needn't have happened. You know, that some of the changes that, that were speeded up by the war were going to happen anyway. The rise of the United States, um, the great empires were eventually going to disappear. I mean, you could already see those changes um, beginning. But I think the war was such a, a catastrophic event and speeded things up so much and, and left, left a legacy which I think there were things that wouldn't have happened, I think, if the First World War hadn't happened. Um, I don't think the Russian Revolution, the Bolshevik Revolution, would have happened without the First World War. I mean, they were a tiny fringe group, and it was the war that gave them their chance. And that's had huge long-term consequences for the world. So I think the war took the world in one direction um, rather than another. And I'm not sure we would have had the Second World War without the First World War. It really creates the circumstances for the Second World War. Uh, thank you. Maybe could you perhaps still comment a little bit on the outbreak of, uh, of World War I in 1914. Uh, what were the history lessons that we can draw uh, from 1914? Well, I suppose, I mean, two things I, I keep thinking about. One is that if you're a civilian government, you need to know what your military are planning. And too few of them did. You know, and they didn't bother to inform themselves. I mean, the German civilians didn't think it was their business to ask the military what they were planning. And I think you need to know what your military are up to, and you need to make sure who's in charge. And I guess the second thing is, is you know, the danger when a crisis comes is that you start fitting everything the other side is doing into a pattern you see in your own mind, and you don't think of alternative explanations. So you start thinking in scenarios rather than trying to look at possible explanations. So, you know, the Germans see the Russians doing certain things. They say, well, this is all part of a Russian plan. You know, they, they were determined to attack us. And that's dangerous because you stop thinking through and you stop using your imagination to think, is there another explanation here? Um, can, we, can we talk to the Russians? Is there something we can do? If you start to see it as part of a preconceived plan, and I think that the Russians were doing the same with the Germans and the Austrians are doing the same with the Russians, I mean, then you stop thinking. And I think it makes, you know, it feeds into this impression you've got that this terrible peril is building up and you have to do something about it. And what about the, the peacemakers uh, in 1918, a few years later? Uh, do you think they were thinking about history, uh, drawing lessons? I'm sure they were, but were they drawing the long, wrong lessons or the right lessons uh, from what had just transpired? Were they, do you think, missing something obvious, um, influenced by their national sentiments in the wrong way? Um, and I guess to link this to Geneva, was the creation of the League of Nations perhaps either negatively or positively influenced? by certain historical memories that, or baggage, certain historical baggage that the, hist uh, that the policy makers carried with them to the conference table. I think they were under such pressure. I mean, we tend to forget mm -hmm. just what they were trying to do. You know, the, 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 everything was sort of piling in on them. And I think what they were trying to do is set up something to prevent something like the war they had all just come through ever happening again. Um, you know, and, and this, I think the League which is often seen by Americans as something that Woodrow Wilson wanted and none of the Europeans did, which is completely wrong. You know, I think a lot of the Europeans wanted the League just as much as, as a lot of Americans did. Um, in fact, with more emotional feeling because they just lived through the horrors of the war. Um, so I think you know, they were trying to avert trouble. But what they were also dealing, of course, was, was competing national claims and competing national narratives and national histories. 
and this was a time when history was really used. You know, we have to have this piece of land because historically it was ours 300 years ago. And the trouble, of course, in the center of Europe, more than one nation could say that about the same piece of land. Thank you very much, Professor Macmillan. It's been a great pleasure discussing with you the relationship between history and policy this afternoon. Well, thank you. It's been a pleasure. <laughs>